Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food, is so nourishing and so easily digested, so useful in a hundred appetizing ways, you'll find it a wonderful help in menu planning. For a tempting main dish, blend Pabstet's mellow cheddar cheese flavor into nourishing and economical macaroni and au gratin dishes. Or melt Pabstet into a smooth, luscious cheese sauce for vegetables, hard-cooked eggs, chicken, or fish. For lunchbox sandwiches or quick company treats, spread delicious Pabstet on crackers or between layers of enriched bread. Yes, there are a hundred different ways Pabstet can please your family and guests. And especially important these days, Pabstet helps supply important food elements, muscle-building milk protein, food energy, milk minerals, and important vitamin A. So for delightful menu surprises, buy wholesome, nourishing Pabstet. Whenever you can, serve this delicious golden cheese food, Pabstet. <laughs> Now let's see how things are going with the great Gildersleeve. Like all candidates for public office, he finds it expedient now and then to retire from the strain of campaigning and spend a day quietly in the bosom of his family, denying himself to all but photographers. Today is Saturday and Gildersleeve has planned such a day. No photographers are clamoring at his door, but if one happened by now, he'd find the great man standing on the front porch with his niece Marjorie, surveying his acres and sampling the morning air. Ah, uh, just breathe that air, Marjorie. Go on, breathe some of it. Mm, it's wonderful. Where else can you get air like that? You know, I wouldn't live anywhere else for a million dollars. Neither would I. You take where Judge Hooker lives, even. Of course, it's only three blocks from here. But somehow the air isn't the same. I notice the difference the minute I turn the corner. I think it's spring that's turned the corner. Huh? What do you I mean? mean? Well, see how green everything is. Why, in another week, the lilacs will be out. It's really here, Uncle Mort. It's, it's spring. Yes, it's spring. What is it the fellow says? Uh, spring with its eternal promise? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> spring, spring, thou lovely thing. <laughs> Why, Uncle Moore? <laughs> I'm a poet and I don't know it. <laughs> you know, you get awfully silly in the spring. Well, who doesn't? <laughs> Come on, let's sit down here on the swing and be comfortable, my dear. Ah. <laughs> You gotta remember to put some oil on that. <laughs> Remind me next spring. Oh, I love spring. And I love this place. I love every tree and every bush and every little thing about it. Yeah, I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. And the grass. See how green it is. You can almost see it growing. I can almost see me mowing. <laughs> oh, well, Leroy's a big boy now. <laughs> Where is Leroy? He ducked out right after breakfast. Do you want him? No, let him go. What's he up to? I don't know. He borrowed a quarter from Bertie before he left. She'll probably never see it again. I've told him time and again he's not... Bertie, is that you? Where are you, Miss Gilsey? Out on the porch. Come on out. Miss Gilsey, you going downtown today? I wasn't planning to, Bertie. I doubt if I even stir off this porch today. It's so comfortable here. Oh, shucks. I should have asked Leroy. He was going anyway. Uh, by the way, Bertie, I understand you lent Leroy some money this morning. Yes, sir. well, I... Now, I've told Leroy he's not to ask you for money, and I've asked you not to lend him any. Well, I wouldn't say I lent it to him exactly, Mr. Gilsey. You wouldn't? No, sir, I just advanced it to him. The distinction is a highly technical one, Bertie. Is what? Lending and advancing. The distinction is scarcely perceptible from where I sit. I'm sorry, Mr. Gilsey, you ain't coming through so good this morning. <laughs> I say, what's the difference between lending money to Leroy and advancing it? Well, advancing money is where you're going to get it back come payday. Lending it is where you kiss it goodbye. <laughs> Leroy's going to pay it back. Well, see that he does. Uh, what did he want it for, anyway? Oh, he made me promise not to tell. No, Bertie. Here comes Leroy on his bicycle. Uh? Yes, sir, you better ask him. Hey, Uncle, look, no hands! Leroy, oh, my goodness, don't do that. One of these days, he'll break his fool neck. No such luck. It I got it, Bertie. Hi, Unc. Leroy, where have you been? 
shopping. Stick in your shirt tail. What were you shopping for? Present. And who, may I ask, were you buying a present for with money which you borrowed from Bertie when I told you repeatedly you're not to do so? Well? Could you give me that again? <laughs> What's the matter with everybody around here? I speak English, don't I? Excuse me, I got to look enough. Leroy, who was the present for? Miss Goodwin. Miss, uh, oh, well, Miss Goodwin, eh? Leroy, what's back of all this? Nothing, Mom, nothing at all. He just wants to get promoted, that's all. June is coming. I do not. I mean, I do so... Tell her to keep out of this, Aunt. Well, if you didn't wait till the last minute every day to do your homework... Now, Marjorie, I'll handle this. Leroy? Yes, Aunt? How do you account for this sudden burst of generosity? Well, gosh, I don't see why everybody has to get so suspicious all of a sudden. Answer me. What prompts the giving of this rich gift? Don't you know? Tomorrow's Mother's Day. Mother's Day? And you're planning to give Miss Goodwin... Yeah, you want to see it? It's super. I got it right here. What? Paid a buck and a half for it at the Dollar's Main Mix Shop. I saw it in the window. A buck and a half. There. How do you like it? What is it? It's a pin cushion. What do you think? <laughs> oh. Genuine silk. It's blue. So I see. It's got pins in it, too, and they're hard to find, aren't they, Marge? You see, they're stuck into it so they spell mother. Well, that's very clever. A buck and a half. You think she'll like it, Unc? Well, it's a very pretty pincushion, my boy. The only thing oh, is... Oh, I'm going to wrap it up nice. I thought maybe you'd probably be going over there today and you could take it with you and give it to her so she'd get it in time for... Don't you think she'll like it, Unc? Oh, it's very pretty, Leroy, very. It ought to be. It cost a buck and a half. <laughs> it's very generous of you to want to give it to her, Leroy. The only thing is... Well, my boy, women are funny in some way. Now, Miss Goodwin, she's swell. That's not what you used to say about her. I think she's swell. You want to make something out of it? So do I. So there. <laughs> now, children, what I'm trying to say, Leroy, is I think that's a very fine pincushion. Buck and a half. <laughs> However, I also think it may be rushing things just a little to give Miss Goodwin a present for Mother's Day when she's not your mother. Not yet. She won't be our mother anyway. She'll be our aunt. Oh, gosh, I thought she'd like it. I went and spent a buck and a half. <laughs> I'm sure she'd like it, my boy. But as I say, women are apt to be touchy about these little matters. They don't like to think of themselves as Whistler's mother. <laughs> Uncle Moore's right. But I'll tell you what you do. Now, why don't you save it and give it to her for a wedding present? When? Well, when we get married. When is that? Yes, when are you going to get married? <laughs> well, that's a little indefinite. You mean she ain't saying? <laughs> no, we have a definite understanding about it, Leroy. We... We have a definite understanding. All right, what is it? Well, we decided, your Auntie Eve and I, that it would be too complicated to try to get married at the same time I'm running for mayor. Well, then why run for mayor? <laughs> uh, so you have a point there, my boy. But Eve is very anxious to have me do it. She wants me to be the mayor. In fact, she promised that if I win the primaries in June, that same day she'll name the date of our wedding. And if you don't win, what then? <laughs> of course he's going to win, Leroy Yeah, but what if he doesn't? We haven't really gone into that, my boy Well, you better go into it I don't want to get stuck with a pincushion that cost a buck and a half Will there be anything else, Dr. Needham? No, that's all, I think, Mr. Peavy. You'll be sure and thank Mrs. Peavy, won't you? I don't know how we could run a church supper without her. <laughs> well, she enjoys it. Well, Peavy, you old son of a gun, how... Oh, hello, Dr. Needham. <laughs> Good day, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> I didn't see you when I first came in. Uh, that will be 25 cents, Dr. Needham. 25 cents. Uh, and the penny tax, of course. Of course. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Eh, hey, Mr. Gildersleeve? <laughs> That's right. Uh, by the way, Doctor, I may be requiring your services before long. Oh, so? In what capacity? Well, you may not have heard I'm engaged to be married. <laughs> well, that will be a pleasure, Mr. Gildersleeve. A real pleasure. Good day. Good day, Mr. Peavy. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. Good day. Bye, George. He's a pretty good fellow. I wonder if you heard me say son of a gun, Peavy. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about the doctor. He has a great sense of humor. Oh? Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He says that every time he pays the penny tag. Yes, I know. Well, what can I do for you this afternoon? 
Not a thing, Peavy. I just dropped in to chew the fat for a while if you're not busy. Not at all. Is uh, the happy day really drawing nigh for you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Right after the election, I'll be the happiest man in the world. She's the finest woman I've ever known. Woman is a noble sex, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'd say it was the nobler of the two sexes. You're right, Peavy. Now you take Mother's Day. <laughs> Only a woman can be a mother. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Probably a good thing, too. <laughs> well, Judge Hooker. Hello, Peavy. Well, Gildersleeve, busy campaigning, I see. And I'm just resting for the moment, Judge. Peavy and I are talking about the nobility of women. Women. Give me a pack of razor blades, Peavy, and a bottle of those liver pills. <laughs> Sour grapes, Judge. All right, laugh, Gildy. You're no better off than I am. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve's engaged to be married, you know. Yeah, I know, I know. But there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. And Gildersleeve ought to know. Now, see here, Hooker. You better get it in writing, Gildy. Just a year ago, you were waltzing up the aisle with Leela Ransom. This is different. No, I don't think Mr. Gildersleeve has anything to worry about. Well, you don't know, Peavy. Women are tricky. No, not tricky, Judge. Just cautious. Oh? How do you mean? <laughs> Well, I can remember Mrs. Peavy when she was getting ready to name the day. I was with a wholesale drug firm at the time, Dunninger and Holtz it was. And I can remember the day she said she'd marry me just as plain as if it was yesterday. Well, how could any man forget it? Yes, sir. I called on her one Sunday afternoon. I used to call on her every Sunday afternoon, as a matter of fact. And I'd always take along some little token, a bouquet of flowers or box of taffy. Uh, we were both very fond of taffy in those days. Come on, Peavy, what happened? I'm coming to it, Judge. <laughs> I used to ask her to name the day every couple of months or so, and on this particular afternoon, I asked her again. I'll never forget her answer. What did she say, Peavy? She said, Richard, I'll marry you just as soon as you open your own drugstore. So... Here I am in my own drugstore. Yeah, but what if you hadn't opened your own store? She would have married him just the same. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Mrs. Peavy has a mind of her own. See, Gildy, that's women for you. They'll only marry you for what they can get out of you. Judge, that is a disgusting statement. That may be true of some women, but not Eve. Eve is different. Eve will marry me whether I'm elected or not. Are you sure, Gildy? I'm positive. What's more, I'm going right over and find out. Well, in the middle of the morning? Sure. What's the matter with the morning? <laughs> Nothing, Throckmorton, except that I was just going out. Would you like to come in just for a minute? I'll come in for a minute and stay the rest of the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Throckmorton, aren't you... I'm taking the day off. Oh, is Mayor Terwilliger taking the day off? Now, Eve, a man can only campaign so much. That's no way to win an election. Let's forget the election. Wouldn't you like to take the day off and have a little fun? I can't. And I don't think you should either. Oh, come on, Eve. Besides, I've got something I'd like to ask you about. You can ask me about it tonight. I have a teacher's meeting in a few minutes. Eve, don't I mean anything to you? Of course you do, only the Eve, thing... Eve, there's something I gotta know right away. What's that, Throckmorton? Well, I got to thinking... Uh, I'm just wondering. We get married in June, huh? Maybe. Right after the election? It all depends. Depends on what? Doc Morton, that reminds me. I wrote my mother about you. I never do a thing without consulting mother. Would you like to hear what she said? What did you write her about me? Oh, I told her I'd met you and how kind you'd been to me and what an important man you were getting to be. Is that all? Just about. Would you like to hear what she said about you? Well, some other time. But right now, Eve, I've got to know where I stand. Suppose I don't get elected. I refuse to consider that possibility. So should you. Well, of course, I'm going to keep right on plugging away, Eve. I'll do my best. And you'll win. I'm sure you will. What if I don't? Let me show you what Mother said. I've got a letter right here. Oh, for goodness sake. Let's see. The weather has been rather chilly, so and so and so and so. Nancy Grant had a baby last week, so and so and so and so. Oh, here. Mr. Gildersleeve, from your description, sounds very forceful and dynamic. I'm sure he has a real future in politics. There. Politics? What about my other future? Haven't you said anything to your mother about us? Maybe I have. What did she say about that? <laughs> I don't have to tell you everything, do I, darling? Well, I want to know where I stand. Well, our engagement's been announced, hasn't it? I've been engaged before. 
What I want to know is, if I don't get elected... Throckmorton, you're being a defeatist. I won't consider that possibility. In fact... Oh, dear, they're blowing for me. I've got to go. But, Eve, can't you answer a simple question? Later. See you tonight, darling. Now, now where am I? By George, if I didn't know her so well, I'd say she was tricky. The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Now, more tempting ways to serve Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food. Children simply love the wholesome, nourishing cheese goodness of Pabstet, so here are some special treats for the youngsters. Before serving vegetable soup, crumble Pabstet and let its mellow cheddar cheese flavor blend extra richness into this tempting soup. Cream potatoes and cream spinach made with Pabstet are sure to be greeted with ahs and ohs of delight. And between meals, crackers spread with Pabstet are treats that hungry youngsters will light into with lip-smacking satisfaction. There's just no end to the tempting ways of serving nourishing Pabstet. So whenever your dealer has a supply on hand, ask for the familiar round, flat package and buy this delicious golden cheese food, Pabstet. Delight the whole family. Remember, it's the original whole milk cheese food, so be sure to ask for Pabstet. <laughs> Let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. He's been at loose ends ever since his inconclusive talk with Eve Goodwin, so he's spending the afternoon alone at home, moodily trying to read, to listen to the radio, and to keep Leroy's dog out of his chair. Now, however, comes an interruption. Oh, now what? <coughs> Shut up, Jeep. Well, good afternoon, Leela. Hello, Throckmorton. I hope you don't mind my dropping over, but it's such a lovely day. No, no. Glad to see you. Come in. <coughs> Get out of here, Jeep. <coughs> oh, I just couldn't stand being cooped up over there another minute, and I just thought, well, now, I'll, I'll just go have a nice, friendly visit with Throckmorton. Oh, well, fine. I've just been sitting around not doing a thing. Come in and sit down. Oh, thank you. It's nice in here. I've always liked this room. You have? Mm. I've always liked this couch, too. <sighs> Seems like old times, just the two of us here, doesn't it, Throckmorton? Yeah, just like old times. <laughs> I'm terribly happy for you, darling. About Eve, I mean. That's good. She's a fine woman. One of the finest women I ever met, really. She is a fine woman. When is the happy day to be, Throckmorton? Uh, we have a sort of a flexible arrangement. Mm. <laughs> Probably in June. Oh, June's a lovely month for a wedding. Just think, a year ago... <sighs> You're being awfully nice about this whole thing, Leela. Oh, but I think Eve is so perfect for you. You're almost as tall as she is. I, I'm... <laughs> Sure, most people will never notice. When she wears low heels, I'm taller than she is. <laughs> well, of course, I don't suppose she'd want to wear low heels very often, but <laughs> honestly, I don't think those are the things that matter at all. It's the understanding between two people that matters. Well, Eve understands me perfectly. I just wish I could get to know her better. I'm certain she must be terribly interested. Oh, she is. Fine talker, very well informed, mm. but she's never boring. You know, some well-informed women are boring. I suppose so. I don't suppose you ever think about us anymore, do you, Throckmorton? Us? We had some happy moments, a few. <laughs> I like to remember them sometimes. We had a lot of fun, Leela. Do you remember the time we got caught in the rain and had to spend all afternoon in that funny little country store? And we played checkers for two hours. Mm. <laughs> and I didn't win one game. You always were too smart for me, Throckmorton. You weren't trying. Oh, yes, I was. Do you remember that afternoon we went out on the picnic, just the two of us, and we just lay on the grass and looked up at the clouds? Yeah, I remember. We didn't talk sensibly or think about anything. We just acted like two silly people who were in love all afternoon. Wasn't it silly? No, 
What was silly about it? Oh, we did such silly things. <laughs> Are you still ticklish, Throckmorton? Now, nah, Leela. <laughs> Leela. <laughs> Cut it out, Leela. <laughs> Leela. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that, I know. You can if you want to. <laughs> no, no, I mustn't. Go ahead and tickle me, Leela. Uh, no. Leela? Oh, Throckmorton, you mustn't. Oh, Throck... Hmm. <laughs> Throckmorton, Throckmorton, what are we doing? Hmm. <sighs> Imagine how we ever... We were swept away. Oh, Throckmorton, how can I ever face Eve? How can you face her? What about me? You mustn't worry about it, darling. Eve is so understanding. I'm sure she would realize it was just a slip. Oh, she'd never forgive me. Oh, of course she would, Throckmorton. I only hope she can forgive me. It was my fault, Leela. It was all my fault. Well, I'll forgive you, you poor boy. <laughs> Uh, I'm not worthy of her. I'm not worthy to touch the ground she walks on. I'm not worthy to kiss the hem of her garment. How could I do a thing like that? I must be no good. <sighs> well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, Dr. Needham. We meet again. Yes, we meet again. I suppose you're out for a little stroll? Yes, I usually take a little constitutional after supper Saturday evening. Sets me up for Sunday. Will I be seeing you in church tomorrow? Oh, yes, yes, you certainly will. Good, good. I am. Uh, I felt the need of church lately. The world needs the church, Mr. Gildersleeve. If the world but knew it. Uh, you're right, Doctor. You're absolutely right. Goodbye. <laughs> It's the only thing to do. I'll just throw myself on her mercy. I'll just say to her, Eve, I've been a bad boy. Please forgive me. I'll just say to her, I don't know how it happened, Eve. I didn't mean to do it. It just happened. I'll say... Throckmorton. Hello, Eve. Well, come in, silly. Oh, uh, thanks. I wasn't expecting you quite so early, but... Oh, then... am I too early? Well, I could go away and come back again. Oh, nonsense. I'm glad you came early. Now we can have a nice long evening together. Well, aren't you going to take your hat off? Oh, forgot. <laughs> I'll take it. Thanks. There. Now come in the living room. Thanks. Well, darling, aren't you going to kiss me? It's quite proper, you know. We're engaged. Eve. <laughs> yes? Nothing. There's something troubling you, Throckmorton. What is it? It's nothing. Not a thing. Oh, you're tired then, poor dear. Why don't you lie down here and stretch out on the sofa? Come on. Well, where will you? I'll just kneel here beside you. I'm the one who should be kneeling. <laughs> oh, no. No, just stretch out and relax. That's it. <sighs> You've had a hard day, haven't you? Well, it has been rather strenuous. <laughs> what have you been up to since I saw you? Huh? Uh, guess who I saw on the way over here? Uh, Dr. Needham. Oh, really? He's such a fine man, Dr. Needham. Yeah, only he always gives you the feeling that he can see right through you. Mm -hmm. uh, we must go to church tomorrow, Eve. I'd love to go with you. Yeah, we must do that. Eve? Yes, Throckmorton? Nothing. <laughs> Darling, you're troubled about something I can tell. There's something you want to tell me. No, no. Sit up a moment. Huh? What for? So I can sit down. <sighs> there. Now lean back and just let me hold your head in my lap. <laughs> your forehead feels hot. It is. Let me stroke it for you. <laughs> your fingers are so cool, Eve. So cool and sweet. This will take all the pain and all the worry and all the weariness away. Oh, Eve, you're wonderful. 
so sweet and understanding? There's not much a woman can give a man, Throckmorton, if she can't give him understanding. And you do. You understand so well. Eve. Yes, darling? Nothing. <laughs> All right. Just lie quietly. Don't tell me if you don't want to. Oh, but I do. I mean, there's nothing to tell, really. <laughs> nothing much. <laughs> then it can't be anything to worry about. No, it isn't. The whole thing is silly. Completely silly. Didn't amount to raw beans. It was just... Eve. Yes? Do you believe that a kiss means anything? Do I believe that a kiss means anything? Well, that's hard to say. It all depends. No, I don't think the kiss itself means anything. It's the thought behind it. Exactly. That's the way I feel. <laughs> I mean, after all, there are kisses that you just... And then there are other kisses. That's it. Sometimes you kiss somebody and it means no more than a slap on the back. Well, I've never thought of it that way. And then there are other kisses that are special. Like this. <sighs> Bend down to Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Gracious, I'm losing my hair, but... Oh, Eve, you're wonderful. That's what I like about you. Do you understand? Well, a girl can only try. I should have known. You're not like the others. You're wonderful. And I'm a dope. Oh, no, Throckmorton. Yes, I am. I'm a dope. Would you believe it? I've been worried to death all afternoon. <laughs> what about? Silliest thing in the world. Leela Ransom came over this afternoon, and we were sitting around talking, and one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I slipped her a quick kiss. And all the rest of the day, I worried about it. Can you beat it? <laughs> yeah. Eve is something... Uh... How could you, Throckmorton? How could you? You leave that woman and come over here? But, Eve, it didn't mean anything. You said so yourself. Gosh, it didn't mean anything more than a slap on the back. It may have been a slap on the back to Mrs. Ransom, but it's a slap in the face to me. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm very tired. I'm very tired of a number of things. I give up. I give up. I... She's right. I was a bad boy. Here's a strange situation. While other foods are being rationed, we're urged now to cut loose and fill up on eggs. It seems this country has more eggs right now than it knows what to do with, and a very good thing to do with them is to eat them. There are good reasons for this sudden surplus. The hens have been going all out for victory, and at the same time, we're hard up for storage facilities and crates to pack the eggs in. We have to keep them moving direct from hen to consumer. It's a good thing, really, because doctors tell us that eggs have what it takes. They say we'd all be healthier if we ate them at least once a day. Well, not only do eggs supply many of the things we miss with those steaks we're not getting, but they have a specialty of their own. They help prevent pellagra. And right now, because of the surplus, eggs are cheaper than they're likely to be for some time. So it's a good chance to lay up a little extra health against hard times to come. Yeah, personally, Mr. Carpenter, I make a practice of eating two eggs for breakfast every morning, rain or shine. Yeah, I was just about to remark, Mr. Gildersleeve, I've never seen you looking better. Oh, I never felt better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard what the man said, folks. Let's eat all the eggs we can get while this surplus lasts, because if we don't, the farmers are going to start laying off hens, and when the lean season comes around again, we'll be right back where we were before. Yeah, and that would be ridiculous. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> on this program was directed by Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and the complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>